Thank you, Melody. Turn with me, if you will, to uh, Luke chapter 11 this morning. And as you're turning, let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, we are so grateful to be in your house, grateful to be able to open your word freely, to be able to study and contemplate, and then I trust to go away and apply the things that we learn, to be hearers of the word and not doers, you tell us, is to be self-deceived, the worst kind of self-deception, really, and so will you please apply the word to our lives by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Father, our hearts are heavy this morning. We pray for the Pickett family again. Ask that, um, Lord, you'll help us all to realize the brevity of life. Um, But in the meantime, please bring comfort and peace and, Lord, just uh, some understanding of of, uh, how you're working pray for them. We pray for the Resource Center. We thank you, Father, for organizations like this that help those who are in need. And uh, what a privilege it is to be just a small part of their ministry. So uh, bless them. Be with our Guatemala team as they prepare. Last meeting, planning tonight, I think, and then it's just getting everything in the right trucks and pickups and and off they go. And Lord, we're praying that it's not just, um, not just bringing physical help there, although we're extremely grateful for the uh, wonderful help that our dentists will bring to a community that has nothing like this available to them. Thank you for all, all three of the dentists who will be going and participating and those who will be helping. Lord, we're also praying that you will open doors to spiritual understanding by this team Give them opportunity to speak to people. Give them opportunity, Father, to represent you, to show how wonderful it is to belong to you and how much we need that. Pray that that will be true and that you'll keep them safe, you'll keep them healthy, and bring them back, uh, Father, with lives changed, and we pray that ours would be too. Help us again as we look to your word today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue this uh, series, Teach Us to Pray, we um, come to Luke 11. We're still looking at kind of an overview of this passage. Family had some guests for dinner one night, and uh, as they sat down, Dad asked his little six-year-old daughter, you know, would you like to pray tonight? He said, oh, yeah, Dad, but I, I wouldn't know what to say. He said, well, just, just say what you hear Mom say. She said, Okay. She said, Lord, why on earth did I invite all these people for dinner? (laughs) So I'm guessing that that dad wished maybe that she had been copying the example of Jesus rather than her mom at that point in time when it comes to praying. But what a wonderful opportunity we have here to just kind of stop for a while and see what it means to communicate with God. Will you notice that that the disciple asked this, didn't say, Jesus, please teach us how to pray. He said, teach us to pray. The how, beloved, is very insignificant compared to the fact that we actually pray. And that's what this disciple was asking. So as we continue today to look at the overview. We'll start on the details next week to kind of unpack those, but uh, the overview, we started last week. So the first thing we see here is that prayer is entree to God, not to self. It's not a means of tapping into the inner strength, into my, you know, inner being of some kind that some people claim that it is, but it's in fact an audience with the God of all the universe. And here we are. I mean, look around the next time you're there and ask yourself, how in the world did I get here? We don't deserve to be there. We could never deserve to be there in the presence of God. But because of the work of Jesus Christ, we have access. And it's a place where we are wanted and where we are certainly invited. The presence of God. 
Second thing we saw is that prayer is essential. It's not optional. It's at the heart of the ministry of Jesus Christ. He's forever praying, indicating that it's not optional in the issue of living a Christian life. To think that we are living a Christian life without prayer is to only fool ourselves. You know, if we have to ask ourselves if Jesus needed it, how much more do we need it? To align ourselves with the will of God, not aligning him with our will, but aligning, aligning ourselves with his will. That's what prayer is about. Third thing, as we begin this morning, prayer is hard, not easy. You know, praying itself isn't so hard, but taking the time to pray, very hard, right? I don't know why. Well, I do know why. We have an enemy who doesn't want us doing that, right? So it's hard. Expect it. It's going to be hard to take the time to pray. These hard-boiled fishermen, you can imagine, this was not their want, these activist businessmen, to stop and to take time to spend with the God that they couldn't see, hear, touch, or feel. They were not prone to this and to learn this. R.C. Sproul wisely says, prayer is not something that comes naturally. No one is born a good prayer. For there is nothing more repugnant to fallen man, to natural man, than to spend time alone with God. If you find it hard to pray, join the club. Right? right up until the moment of Jesus' crucifixion and then ascension back to the Father, these men found it difficult to pray. You remember Peter, James, and John in the Mount of Transfiguration? Sleeping, right? They almost missed one of the great moments in all of history because they were sleeping. We're told in Luke 5, verse 15, of Jesus, it says, but he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. We see that often. We don't see, interestingly enough, the disciples going with him. And when they are invited to Gethsemane, you remember three times in a row, sleeping, when more than ever, Jesus needed them to be fellowshipping with him in prayer. They could not be there. Prayer is hard for everyone, including the men whose names are written in the foundation of heaven. Imagine that. But beloved, their names aren't written in the foundation stones of heaven because they found it hard to pray. They're written there because eventually they found it worthwhile to pray, even though it's hard. Right? So expect that it's going to be hard. We must do it anyway. Some years ago, a guy applied for a job, you know, with the logging crew. And the superintendent said to him, well, cut that tree down and we'll see whether we can use you or not. So he did, and everything went well. He placed the tree right where the guy wanted it. And he said, I'll tell you what, start Monday. Come on and be here. So he came on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And on Thursday night, the superintendent came to him and said, uh, Mac, pick up your paycheck on the way out tonight. He said, what, what, do you, what do you mean? He said, I thought you guys paid on Friday. He said, we do pay on Friday, but we're letting you go. And the guy said, what, you're, you're letting me go? He said, I'm the, I'm the first one here in the morning. I'm the last one to leave at night. I, I work right through my break. How could you let me go? He said, well, we've noticed that you were, you were first on Monday. You were the best. But by Wednesday, you were the worst. And by Thursday, you were no better. We have to let you go. And he says, well, please, couldn't you reconsider? There must be something going on here. And the guy thought about it for a minute, and he thought, this is a man of integrity. He said, uh, he said tell me something. He said, have you been sharpening your ax? And the guy said, sharpening my ax? He said, I don't have time to sharpen my ax. I've been working. That's like us, beloved, when we're not praying, thinking we're doing the Lord's work. Can't do the Lord's work if we're not Praying, right? Remember what John Bunyan said? You can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you can't do more than pray until you've prayed. It's true. If we're going to serve our Lord, the first thing that has to be on the agenda is that we're spending time in prayer. Now, okay, if that one's a little tough, this one I hope will encourage you a little bit. Prayer is simple. It's not complicated. Prayer is 
simple. It's not complicated. It may be hard, but it's not complicated. This is kind of amazing, really, because I think, I think prayer has, it sort of takes on this, this magical, you know, ethereal, above me kind of a thing in our minds. And it shouldn't. The thing that, I, that strikes me about this passage is the disciple comes to the Lord and says, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus responds. How does Jesus respond? Well, let's go, to the, let's go to the Psalms and look at how David prayed. Let's go to Second Chronicles and see how Solomon prayed. Let's check the prayers out in the Bible. Is that what he said? He gave him three verses with five petitions. How hard is that? It's not complicated. We overcomplicate prayer. Now, I'm not suggesting that Jesus is saying that we're supposed to just say these five things over and over. That's not his point, but his answer does indicate this is not complicated. It's not a complicated process. It doesn't have to be involved. It doesn't have to be long. I think a lot of us think prayer has to be long. Better often than long. We don't feel like we haven't prayed if we haven't you know, been there for 10 minutes or something. It's not according to some formula. Prayer is, you know what, pra prayer is just, it's, it's opening my heart to touch the heart of God. That's what prayer is. Some people say, well, pray scripture. If you don't know what to do, just read the Psalms and as you read it, pray it back to God as a request for him. That's a great thing. But do you have to do that? No. You listen to some people pray and they have this great introduction that, you know, itemizes the characteristics of God, the attributes of God, kind of one after the other. And you're thinking, I don't even know all of those. How can I do that? Do you, so is it, is it good to praise God for his attributes? I, you know, I love each time I pray to kind of think about one thing, God's holiness, God's mercy, God's love, God's wrath against him, whatever, and, 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 and concentrate on that a bit perhaps when we pray. But do, you, do we have to do that when we pray? No. A lot of us have learned, and it's a wonderful tool, the ACTS acronym. What does prayer consist of? Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. That's a great tool. Do you have to do all of those every time? No. We've overcomplicated the whole thing, beloved. Prayer is not complicated. Prayer at its core is my heart connecting with the heart of God. I, I love this example. Some of you will remember because you were there, I think, but Dick Foth, who is a pastor at Timberline, spoke at the Christian Businessmen's Meeting prayer breakfast a couple years ago, maybe two years ago, and he told the story. Dick is, by the way, he's a, he's a, he's a uh, pastor at Timberline now. He's a past president of Bethany College in Santa Cruz, California, but he spent a lot of his career in Washington, D.C. as a kind of a chaplain. He would, he would be a counselor to government officials. He set up prayer breakfasts, and so he got to know a lot of people in the Washington, D.C. area, and he told about one profane, foul-mouthed, you know, womanizing lobbyist, which could have been any lobbyist probably, right? But sorry, if you're a lobbyist, but this lobbyist came to the prayer breakfast because he wanted contacts. He wasn't really there for the prayer. He was there for the contacts. And he came several times, but after he'd been there for a while, he pulled Dick aside one day. He said, Dick, I think I'm in trouble. I need your help. Dick said, what can I do? He said, well, he said, I've been dating a woman. That was not news. But he said, this woman, is a, she's a follower of Christ, and I don't think she's going to keep dating me if I don't give up all the other women. <laughs> Dick says, who would have guessed, right? I mean, what are you going to say? Who would have guessed? So the guy asked for prayer. He wanted to know what to do. But he said, but Dick, he said, look, I don't hold hands. And he says, I don't shut my eyes. And Dick says, okay, we can pray. And so they prayed, not holding hands, eyes open for this guy's little problem. A few weeks later, the guy was back. By this time, he had really fallen for this girl. And he said, uh, 
He said, you know, I was, I was right. She's not going to stay with me if, if I don't give up the other women. And uh, she's made that really clear now. And he says, I still, need, I still need prayer for what to do. Dick said, okay, I'll be glad to pray. Well, the guy says, well, you know that open eye prayer? He said, do you think I could do that? And Dick said, well, sure, you could do that. And so as they stood there in this private place, the guy started out. He said, Lord, I know you're the one that put this woman in my life. And I know what you're doing. You're trying like hell to get me. I know what you're doing. And then he went on and made his request. Well, you can imagine the rest. It was too late. God was hot on his trail. God did get him. He became a believer, gave up the other women, married this woman, cleaned up his act, stopped swearing during his prayers, stopped swearing other times. <laughs> became a believer, became a follower of Christ. But beloved, do you see the point? It isn't complicated. Prayer is just my heart reaching out to God for what is really urgent in my life and hopefully in his work and in my ministry now. It's not complicated. What's another characteristic? Prayer is heartfelt. Heartfelt, not ritual. Many of us grew up on the Lord's Prayer, right? I was fortunately young enough, I can remember, we used to say it in school all the time. I'm sure that would be totally politically incorrect these days, but we used to do that. Messed me up because at church we said debtors and at school we said trespass, but whatever. It was, you know, had to learn both ways. We went to California to a great church out there when I was in high school and, or in early college and we said the Lord's Prayer every, every day, every Sunday. But did the Lord mean for us to repeat this prayer verbatim? Well, in verse, look what he says in verse 2. He says, when you pray, say could be taken to mean that he expects the prayer to be repeated, right? That is not the intent, beloved. The, the disciple is asking the question because he's noticed that when Jesus prays, things happen. Specific requests, specific answers. And that's what he's looking for. And, for, and, and so Jesus, Jesus gives him this, this model prayer. We know it's a model prayer because when Jesus gives something similar in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, he doesn't say it exactly the same way he does it here. He, get, he actually adds two more requests in that particular prayer. This is a shortened version of what he had given earlier. But the point is, it's a, it's a model. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, it shows the themes of prayer that, 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 should, that should attach to our prayers. And we'll see the importance of those beginning next week. But it's kind of a skeletal outline for prayer. So does this mean we should never repeat the Lord's Prayer verbatim? Well, I don't think so. The question is, are we praying it from our heart? The question is, do, do we really mean it? Or are we just praying it because it, because it, it fits into the service somehow or because it makes us feel good because it takes us back to our childhood or, or, or you know, it's just, it's just one of those rituals that, that we feel good about. Is that, is that what we should be doing? I think generally this prayer is not meant for liturgical use. I can tell you one thing. Did, you know, ask yourself this question. Did, did Jesus ever pray this, this, this prayer with his disciples verbatim? I can tell you that he did not. I say, why do you say that? Well, because there's a phrase in this prayer he never could have prayed. It says, forgive us our sins, doesn't it? Jesus had no sins. So the prayer is there as a model, and it's intended to help us bring our concerns to the attention of God in a way that will honor God. And we'll, again, we'll see next week how it starts out and how that can be the case. But prayer is useless if it doesn't come from the heart. Form prayers, I'm not saying they're always bad, that they should never be used. I realize there are churches where that's all they do. But the question is, is the prayer coming from the heart? Are the words really meant? Sometimes it's, it's helpful. And you can pray the Psalms when you're going through some particular thing in your life and it gives you words that you couldn't come up with any other way. So there's nothing wrong with praying that way. But the point is prayer has to come from the heart. It can't be just ritual. 
That's anathema to God. I, I, I worry more that when we pray that way, we're just going through the motions and we're actually bringing the disciplining hand of God down on us because, because we don't mean it. Just going through the motions. This is a skeletal, this is a framework for prayer that Jesus is giving us here. This was exactly the problem with the Pharisees. You know, they prayed long prayers. But Jesus condemns them. He says this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. He says, for they, the Pharisees, they love to stand and pray in the synagogues. Everybody knew this. Everybody looked up to them for it. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that, that they may be seen by others. They were far more intent on how others would think of them than they were on communicating with God. Prayer had become simply a means of exalting themselves, not exalting the Father. Dick Lucas, who is a, he's an Anglican uh, pastor. I think he's still living. He's, he's, he's a pastor emeritus now of a church, an Anglican church in England. Not, not too many Anglican churches that are still preaching the gospel, but he was one of those who certainly did. He was in a church early in his career where he said there were a lot of, there were a lot of people who were well-to-do people. They were, you know, he was near London, and this was kind of the upper crust of society, which is... It's a very class-sensitive society in England, as you probably know. But he said not very many of those people had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And he said it became apparent because he said, I, I would note that during communion, we would, all, we would all stand and we would pray together this confession. By thoughts, deeds, and words, we have sinned most grievously against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and condemnation against us. He said, we pray that every, every Sunday at communion, and I notice everybody's praying it. When I talk to these same people a couple days later in their homes and start talking about the wrath of God against sin, they would say, the wrath of God against sin, God doesn't have any wrath against sin. God loves everybody. So they, they, they were praying condemnation on themselves. It didn't come from their heart. Listen, beloved, God is listening. He knows. He knows our heart. It really doesn't matter what your words are. The question is, are they real? Is this coming from the inside of your being? Next, prayer is an act, not a frame of mind. Prayer is an act, not a frame of mind. Of mind. Many of us have fallen back on Paul's instruction in 1 Thessalonians 5 17, you know, to pray without ceasing. And we've defined that as, well, I just have this mindset of prayer. I just kind of walk around with, you know, the bubble of my head that says prayer all the time. And I'm just kind of thinking prayer once in a while. I don't think that's what prayer is about, and I don't think that's what Paul meant. When Paul said pray without ceasing, he was just encouraging us to make sure that that's a continual part of our habitual Christian life. Just like, you know, the great example in the Bible is Daniel, right? Three times a day, regularly, he prayed. It was a specific act. It wasn't just a mindset. It was a specific act where he would go in his room, he would get on his knees, and he would pray. He certainly wasn't doing that all day long because he was running the country most of the time. But he was praying without ceasing in the sense that days didn't go by in which he didn't pray. He was praying without ceasing in the sense that a morning, noon, or night didn't go by in which he didn't pray. He was praying without ceasing. And that's what Jesus is getting at here. Keep on praying all the time. Don't let days go by where you're not praying. Does this mean prayer can't be a frame of mind? Of course not. That, I mean, one of, the, one of the greatest things we can do, and the older I get, the, the better I get at this, but frankly, God really impressed this upon my mind heavily during a business career in which I thrived in chaos most of the time. And you kind of learn to be praying all the time. You're talking to the Lord about the next thing that's coming down the pike that you have to deal with. It's wonderful to do that, but we have to understand that it's, it's primary essence, prayer is an act. It's not just a frame of mind. Jesus said, when you pray, when you Pray, that's a time, that's an act. He said, when you pray, say 
say is an act. Look at verse 1 again. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, everything in this says prayer is an act, not just a frame of mind. So we need to get that kind of frame of mind thing out of our head as the, as the thing that meets the requirement for pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing means be daily and multiple times during the day as you determine to be in fellowship with God in prayer. Jesus was praying in a certain place. The disciples see it. They saw, they saw when he began. They saw when he finished. It was an act. It involved time. It's an act that takes time. D.L. Moody said, we ought to see the face of God every morning before we see the face of man. Whenever else you pray, I would urge you, pray in the morning. You know, spend some time with the Lord in prayer. It's great to pray at night, too. It's a good time to confess all the things you got wrong during the day and thank God for all the times he helps you get it right. Um, look forward to the next day, but... The disciples eventually got this. They, they started to get the message. Eventually it changed their lives. It will change our lives too. There's nothing, hear me now, there's nothing that will change your, 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 your life more than learning to pray. Sure, there will be things that where it doesn't look like God is answering. You will have to learn to deal with, what God, with God's apparent absence. We'll talk about that. You have to learn to deal with the answers that aren't what you wanted, but you will find some amazing answers that you can't believe. The only problem is you'll, you'll chalk them up to coincidence. Don't do that. If you prayed for it and God answered it, you need to be thanking God for it. It's a breathtaking opportunity to come before the omnipotent, omniscient creator of the universe and make our requests. I guess seventhly, seventh thing, prayer is personal more than public. Prayer is personal more than public. I was hesitant to put that one in. Why? Because I think one of our weaknesses as a church, I said last week, we have many strengths, many things that I thank God for. I am deeply grateful for how God is working in our midst, and I hope you are, and I hope you're continuing to thank him for it. But we are weak in prayer, and we are weak in public prayer. We do not pray together as we ought. It's a burden on my heart. I hope it will be a burden on your heart. As we look for ways to change that, I hope you will support them. We need this. If we want God to work, this is required. So I'm hesitant to say prayer is more personal than public. We need public prayer. Solomon prayed a wonderful public prayer in 2 Chronicles 6 at the dedication of the temple. You find the disciples all the way through the book of Acts praying. Every move they make is bathed in prayer. Prayer fueled the growth of the early church. Acts 2.42, he says, and they, the disciples, they devoted themselves, the, uh, the church members, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. They were praying faithfully. There's nothing more encouraging than to hear someone praying for a need that you've expressed or to be able to pray for someone for a need that they've expressed. This should be at the heart of our life together, of our fellowship. Fellowship needs to revolve around prayer. That's how God is in the middle of it. Public prayer is at the heart of what we should be doing. But even more important, beloved, is private prayer. It is. Even more important is private prayer. Jesus' comments in Luke 11 clearly encourage private prayer. Often the gospel writers mention Jesus going off to pray alone. I find it interesting that seldom does he invite his disciples along. The power of his ministry came from his time alone with the Father. I find passages like Luke 5, 16 over and over, but he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. That was his example, private prayer first, then public prayer. Sometimes, sometimes you know, the danger of public prayer is that we can be doing like, like the Pharisees, we can be praying more for the people who are in the room than we are to God, right? Wanting our, thinking our words have to be just right, uh, worried that we're gonna say something wrong. There isn't anything wrong if your heart is reaching out to God. 
It's just talking to God. I realize if you're not raised on it, sometimes it feels funny to be talking out loud to somebody who you can't even see. But beloved, that's part of living by faith is to realize you can't see him, but he's just as real. He's more real. Paul, as Paul tells in 2 Corinthians 4, he says, the things that are not seen are the things that are real. So when you're talking to Jesus out loud, you're talking to God out loud, you're, you're living more in reality than you when you refuse to because you can't see him an act of faith to be praying so Jesus' example was private prayer and then public it's also his instruction in Matthew 6 verse 5 just turn to one thing today right Matthew 6 just turn back there from Luke Matthew chapter 6 part of the sermon on the mount Matthew 6, verse 5, Jesus says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. What he's saying is their prayer isn't getting higher than the ceiling. But when you pray, go into your room and shut it and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Jesus didn't say that to discourage public prayer in general. He said it to discourage hypocritical prayers. He said it to try and set the stage that prayer needs to be at the heart of our own life individually and then it needs to be at the heart of our life together. Finally, Eighth point, I guess, prayer is petition as much as praise. There's a lot of confusion around prayer, again, because we overcomplicate it. Um, I, I, one of the people I most admire as a Bible, he's, I mean, he's long dead now, but as a, as a wonderful preacher, wonderful <laughs> example of Christian living, wrote a book called Prayer, Asking and Receiving. And in that book, I didn't bring the quote this morning, but he says, prayer is not praise, it's not thanksgiving, it's not worship, prayer is just asking God. That's wrong. It isn't biblical. All you gotta do is check out the prayers in the Bible. You know, one of the most interesting prayers in the Bible is Jonah in Jonah chapter two. Read it sometime. If you were the belly of a whale, what would you be doing? God, get me out of here. There's nothing of that in that prayer. It's amazing. He's just worshiping God. So is prayer and praise and worship and thanksgiving part of prayer? Absolutely. We're going to see all of those in this model prayer that Jesus gives, including, I think, I, for years I didn't think I could find thanksgiving. Now I think it's there and I'll tell you where. But, but all of those are part of prayer. But you know, here's, here's what strikes me from this general perspective, from this bird's eye view that we're taking. You look at when the, the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, and what does Jesus give them? He gives them five petitions. Five petitions. Now, in those petitions, there is praise. In those petitions, there is worship. But it's five petitions. Prayer is asking God. He wants us to come and ask. And we need to do that humbly, we certainly need to do that within his will. I've said this before, I'll say it again because I think it's in the Bible from cover to cover, but trying to impose my will on God in my prayers is wrong. Prayer is about understanding what God wants. Certainly I can express what I want, what I think is best, what I think is right. But I must always acknowledge that his ways are greater than my ways. And so I come to him looking for his best, but I come asking humbly. See what God will do. James 4, James says, you do not have because you do not ask. That's pretty simple. What is it you need? Are you asking? Praise should always accompany our asking to remind us who we are with. I just think, you know what, I just think it's tough to be a Christian in America. Does anybody else agree? I, I really do. I just think it's tough. 
I think we're so affluent. We have so much of God's blessing that we just take for granted that it's tough to be a Christian. We, I, I, I think we have a lot of people who think they are who aren't. Tough to be a, a Christian because, because we have it so good. John Piper reminds us of this. I think it's John. I hope, hope so I didn't look this up either. But John Piper who says our affluence has caused us to, we don't understand prayer. We, to, we treat prayer like a nice little conversation you know, between us and God. And he said, that's not what prayer is about. He says, we're in spiritual warfare. Prayer is about picking up the military walkie-talkie and saying, I need reinforcements here. I need help here. It's our heart crying out to God for what do you, what do you, what do you want to do here? We've, we've, we've forgotten that we're even in a spiritual warfare because we're in the kind of the R&R part of it. Well, the rest of the world language is out there. With, I'm sorry, I'm on a soapbox now, right? But do you see the point? We need to pray as though we really are in a warfare because we are. And the enemy is taking us down. So we don't have because we don't ask. October 1932, a group of men gathered, 29 of them, farmers from North Carolina, they gathered on a, one of their properties out there to pray for revival in a field outside Charlotte, North Carolina. The next year, they had two more great days of prayer like that, all day long, a large group of them. And during that second prayer time, on the farm where they were holding it, the son of the man who owned that farm came home from school and he had a friend with him and they started pitching hay because that's what they were supposed to be doing. And the friend looked at the boy and he said, what, what's all those, what are those guys doing over there? And the, the son said, well, that's day." He said, dad invited a bunch of fanatics over here to pray. What that young man didn't know is that he was the answer to the prayer. It was Billy Graham. The men were praying for someone who would take the gospel around the world they were praying him right into a ministry, preaching ministry, to match any of all time. We don't have because we don't ask. So, beloved, we need to ask. And then we need to trust and believe that God is giving us what we can handle. He's given us what we need. He's not failing us. You can do more than pray after you've prayed. But you can't do more than pray until... You've prayed, so let's pray. Father, we pray for revival. We pray for the outpouring of your Spirit on our community, on our nation, and on our world. We pray, Father, that you will use us, just a little group of believers who would really turn our time and attention toward you Leave you for great things and watch what you will do. I'm amazed, Lord, what you're doing already with our little group. I confess that. But I believe there's more. I know there's more that you want to do. It's just a question of how much we will allow ourselves to be used by you, put ourselves in the way of, of your blessing by our prayers. So teach us, Father. There's so much we need to learn so much we need to know, but at the heart of it, help us to remember, prayer is not complicated. It's just my heart reaching out to your heart. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have to share together as a congregation. Pray that you will guide us in all of our decisions forthcoming in our annual meeting that's coming up and the other activities, particularly the Guatemala team. Will you meet their needs and will you use them greatly as they go? Thank you again for this reminder of what prayer is and can be. Use it to stimulate us and to grow us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.